the meteor shower at the David Dunlap Observatory online with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre. My name is Denise Chilton and I am the RASC Toronto Centre DDO Committee Chair and an operator of the 74 inch telescope right here behind me at the David Dunlap Observatory. This, is, this telescope is Canada's largest optical telescope and tonight you'll learn a bit more about this facility's history and astronomers, especially in connection with our main focus tonight, the Perseid meteor shower. While we miss welcoming guests to the observatory, we are happy to bring you virtual programming instead. So I'm very excited to welcome you, our viewers, to tonight's event. If you haven't already, take a moment to say hi in the Zoom chat and tell us where you're joining us from. This helps us make sure that our technology is working properly and that you guys can hear us. <laughs> um, we would like to start by acknowledging that the David Dunlap Observatory here in Richmond Hill stands on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, whose presence here continues to this day. We would also like to acknowledge this land is at the meeting place of two treaties, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and those of the First Nations of the Williams Treaty. We thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. We're going to kick off this evening's program with Nirja Shaw discussing the origins of the Perseids. Then Eric Briggs will tell us a bit about how and why astronomers observe meteor showers with some important connections to astronomers who worked right here at the DDO uh, and wrote about the Perseids. Finally, Chris Vaughn will tell us about what we can learn from meteorites um, and how to best observe the Perseids for ourselves. We will take your questions toward the end of the presentation, so please do post them in the Zoom chat. I will be monitoring the chat throughout the presentations, and I'm hoping that we can get to all of your questions over the course of the evening. So let's head over now to Nirja and get started. Nirja? Yeah, hi there. So the Perseids. Uh, the Perseids are one of the most important or one of the main significant meteor showers and they appear in August. So let's learn a little bit about them. So the Perseids, they're considered one of the best meteor showers and the main reason behind this is their fireballs. So fireballs are large explo explosions of light and color that, long, that last longer than the average stripe. So Perseids, as I said, they peak around the mid, mid of August with a rate of around 50 to 60 meteor, meteors per hour. That's around the average rate. So Perseids, Perseids meteors hit the Earth's atmosphere at speeds of around 60 km per second, which is pretty quick. And the majority of the majority of these uh, meteoroids are no larger than grains of sand. So one interesting fact is that the Perseid meteor shower was known or was first observed um, 2,000 years ago by Chinese astronomers. So before we move on, it's important to know the difference between uh, comets, asteroids, meteor meteoroids, meteors, um, and just different uh, terms. So comets, as I will talk about um, in a little bit, are just solid bodies made of ice and rock. You can think of them as uh, dirty snowballs. Asteroids are small, rocky, and um, iron or icy debris flying in space. Meteoroids are smaller versions of this. Um, and that's basically the, the type of object that our Earth's atmosphere interacts with. Uh, meteors are the light emitted from a meteoroid or an asteroid as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. And as we said, a fireball is a meteor that's brighter, um, usually brighter than a magnitude of negative four, which is around the magnitude of the planet Venus. Um, and a meteorite, I-T-E, is a fragment of a meteoroid or an asteroid that survives its passage through the atmosphere and hits the ground. So a radiant. So a radiant is the point in sky for our, from which all meteors seem to originate from. 
if you were to trace all these um, meteors back, they would converge at a single point, which is known as the radiant. Uh, meteor showers are named after the constellation this radiant appears in. So for example, Perseids are named after the constellation they appear from, which is Perseus. So how exactly do meteor showers work? So meteor showers are the result of Earth's orbit intersecting with the orbit of a comet. So basically, as you can see in the diagram below, we have the, the blue sphere represents the Earth, whereas the slightish green um, symbol represents the comet. Um, and as comets move across their orbit and approach the sun, they leave behind a cloud of debris behind them. Um, and this field is dense in some areas and lighter in other areas. When the Earth moves through these fields, the Earth's gravity pulls these pieces of debris into the atmosphere. These pieces of debris, which are meteorites, right? Uh, they burn in the Earth's atmosphere due to the friction and become meteors. Perseid mirrors move at an average speed of 59, meters, 59 kilometers per second, or as we earlier said, 60 kilometers per second. Um, and the kinetic energy from the speed ionizes the air it encounters. So as the air ionizes, gas molecules gain electrons. When they lose these electrons, they emit photons. Photons are packets of light. The greater amounts of photons that are released, the brighter the spark. So um, as it ionizes the air it encounters, it leaves a long streak of glowing gas. Most of this gas appears in a thermosphere. So for reference, we have um, five different layers in our atmosphere. We have the troposphere, which is um, just the air we breathe. And then on top of that, we have the stratosphere, which is where we would have um, hot air balloons. On top of that, we have the mesosphere, and then we have the thermosphere, and then the exosphere. The exosphere is where we have our satellites. So now to explain what a comet is. Comets are celestial objects consisting of ice and dust, as we said, and basically they leave behind um, dust as they move around. So the more amount of times they've completed the orbit, the thicker and the more dense their orbit field of debris will be. Its nucleus is the solid and the central part, which sheds particles along its path. So in terms of the Perseids, the comet that um, the Perseids are involved with is Comet 109P, or otherwise known as Comet Swift-Tuttle. So the Comet Swift-Tuttle visits the sun every 133 years, with 1992 being the last time it visited the in our solar system. The comet is one of the largest objects to make repeated passes near the Earth, and it has a diameter of about 26 kilometers or 16 miles. Um, there are many theories about this comet and its effect on Earth, but none have been proven yet. So the comet was discovered in 1862 by Lewis Swift and Horace Tuttle, and Giovanni Giovanni really uh, realized that it was the source of the comet in 1865, and this was a major discovery. So uh, the picture that's seen right here, it's been retrieved from NASA, and it's a picture of um, Comet, comet Swift-Tuttle. So now about colored streaks. As you may have noticed in the images before, the, the comets and the meteors, they appear to be certain colors and each meteor shower has its own unique color. Now, the meteors itself won't be different from each other because they all originate from the same comet. That's why they all have the same color. So Perseids are known for their neon green, purple, pink, and orange and white hues. Now this color is based off of two things, their speed and their elemental com composition. The Perseids are known to consist calcium, sodium, magnesium, and iron. Now they find the um, composition by um, these little spectrums we see here. These are emission spectrums. And basically the way they work is um, as the comet or as the meteors um, heat up, they release uh, certain wavelengths of light. 
and certain elements release different uh, wavelengths of light as they, they're excited. So um, when we receive these, these um, rays of light on Earth, we can put them through um, things like prisms and they differentiate the different rays. Now these rays tell us which element it is. So for example, uh, hydrogen would um, emit this kind of thick red line, this blue, uh, this thin blue line and this somewhat thick purple line. And each element um, has different emission lines. Now the other factor to their color is their speed. So the faster, the faster the meteor is traveling, the more violet the streak will see. Um, and this makes a big difference on their color too. And that's, that's the introduction about uh, Perseids. Thank you so much, Nirja. I think we're gonna go over to Eric next. Eric has some great information on um, observing meteors and why astronomers observe them and the history um, associated with the DDO and meteor observation. Hello, okay, thank you, Nirja. Thank you, Denise. Um, so I'm gonna move on to my first slide. Uh, now this is uh, something that I'm gonna be uh, showing you several of these. Um, these are newspaper columns on the subject of astronomy that have been written in the past uh, by astronomers, uh, in several cases, astronomers who are working at David Dunlap Observatory. Uh, this one here is from a column from the Toronto Telegram newspaper, now defunct. Uh, this was written by Peter Millman, who uh, worked at the University of Toronto and David Dunlap Observatory before World War II. Um, afterwards, he worked at the Dominion Observatory in Ottawa, but he continued to write a newspaper column for this Toronto paper. And uh, I think that this illustration of the constellation Perseus is by himself. Uh, it shows Perseus, uh, the neighboring constellation of Andromeda, and it highlights the star Algol, which is a variable star. Um, Perseus is a, uh, an orphaned hero from Greek mythology. And uh, the story of Perseus involves his, uh, his quest to, uh, to bring back the head of the Gorgon, uh, Medusa. Uh, he was given this quest by uh, the, an evil king um, who thought, well, I'll send Perseus off on this quest and uh, the Medusa will, will destroy him. Um, the, the thing about the Medusa is that if, uh, if it looks at you, then you turn to stone if you see its face. Um, and uh, Perseus was assisted by uh, the god Mercury. Um, if you look at his heels, you can see that he's wearing what looked like winged slippers. And uh, Mercury gave him his winged slippers so that he could travel very fast. And he gave him a special helmet that could make him invisible. And he gave him a special bag to put the head in once he'd, uh, he'd collected it. And a special shield that was very shiny. And um, Perseus, when he found Medusa, uh, was able to avoid being turned to stone by not looking at it, but only by looking at its reflection in, in the polished shield. And uh, he cut off the head and he put it into his magic bag. And uh, the, the body of the Medusa was then transformed. Uh, and we'll see that in a later slide. Uh, so, Medusa's body was transformed into this flying horse, Pegasus, which uh, Perseus then used to, uh, to fly back to where he came from. And Pegasus is a bright constellation uh, with a big square in it. As you can see here, it looks like, sort of like a diamond or a kite, and it appears just so in the eastern sky in the, uh, in the summer evenings. Uh, Alpharats is a star that Millman highlighted in his newspaper column here, I think because he was familiar with using it as a navigational aid uh, when he was in um, working with the Air Force in, uh, in World War II. And uh, Perseus flew uh, Pegasus, um, and he was on his way back to where he came from, but uh, he got 
mixed up in this business with Andromeda that we will hear about in another slide. Um, Andromeda was the daughter of Queen Cassiopeia of Ethiopia, and uh, Cassiopeia had boasted that her daughter was more beautiful than all of the sea nymphs. And so uh, Neptune, the god of the sea, uh, didn't think that was so great, and uh, so um, he decided to, uh, to punish Cassiopeia and, uh, more to the point, Andromeda. Now this uh, area up in the lower, in the upper left-hand corner where it says Nova 1572, um, that's a note that Milman put into his column because uh, of a supernova that appeared in that constellation in 1572. We call it Tycho's star because the astronomer Tycho Brahe uh, helped to discover that star and uh, uh, it was a great discovery. Uh, this is King Cepheus. He is Andromeda's uh, father. Uh, he's Cassiopeia's husband. Um, none of the stars in Cepheus are very bright, um, and we don't really have much to add because he's sort of a secondary character in this myth. The Garnet star that's listed here is an interesting astronomical object because it's extremely red. Uh, it's not all that bright, as I said, but uh, extremely red. Uh, Delta Cephei is uh, another variable star, um, but it's not very similar to the variable star Algol that I was describing a few minutes ago because uh, it brightens and dims very slowly. But then down at the bottom you can see Polaris and perhaps you can make out the little dipper there just to make, uh, make sure that you know which part of the sky this constellation is in. And here is Andromeda herself uh, and she is attached to Pegasus because she's being rescued by Pegasus from her chains, uh, where she was chained to the shore, uh, where the uh, the giant kraken sea monster was sent by Neptune to uh, to to devour her. Uh, but Perseus showed up, and uh, he took the the gorgon's head out of his bag, and he showed it to the kraken, which is also known as the constellation Cetus, and turned the uh, the kraken into stone and uh, he was able to free Andromeda and fly away with her and they were they all lived happily ever after. And uh, so these are all newspaper columns but we're also going to do a little bit of multimedia here. Um, you might want to check out this movie Clash of the Titans. Uh, it was originally made in 1981. It's a Ray Harryhausen type of sword and sorcery flick uh, but they remade it in 3D uh, in 2010. And uh, I admit to being a bit of a fan of the 2010 remake, um, not just because it's, it's a good film, but also because um, I can think of two of the actors in this movie uh, have been involved in some of the, the TV programs that have done some filming at the David Dunlap Observatory uh, not long ago. All right, so moving onwards. Um, Here's a, basically a whole page thing from the, the Toronto Telegram from 1934. Up in the upper right-hand corner, you can see Peter Millman there as a young astronomer. Um, this is the year before the observatory was completed, but all of the buildings were already there. Um, and Millman was working with uh, some of his uh, community astronomy activists to observe the Perseid meteor shower and uh, the newspaper thought it would be good to interview him about it. And Millman uh, had actually used the study of meteors and shooting stars as the subject of his PhD uh, at Harvard in 1932. And he continued to work with meteors, um, and he continued to work with citizen scientists, astronomers who were interested in volunteering, going out on a summer night and looking up and counting meteors to try and find out about more about where they came from. Now, there are several other uh, astronomers who've contributed some of these newspaper items. Um, JRC from this 1928 article, uh, it, that's uh, John Collins, who was a member of the RASC back then. Uh, Peter Millman also had written some items for the Toronto Star, but then he was succeeded by Frank Hogg. Um, and Frank Hogg wrote uh, the column from the early 1940s until the end of 1950. Um, 
And I've also put in a, uh, an item about the Perseids for much later, uh, 1999, in the Toronto Star by Terence Dickinson, who's a Canadian astronomer. Uh, and the one who we all remember is Helen Sawyer Hogg, uh, Frank Hogg's uh, wife. And she wrote the newspaper column uh, in the Toronto Star between 1951 and 1981. Uh, now here is uh, an item that Millman wrote for the Journal of the RASC. Uh, this is the actual report. I mean, the newspaper is only going to be a summary of the work that appeals to a general audience. This was a little bit more academic. Um, but it shows that Millman was working with a large number of community members, uh, even some young people who were interested in astronomy. Um, Ruth Northcott was another astronomer who was working at the DDO, uh, but she was also interested in art, and she was part of a, a summer art collective at Molson's Mill out near Port Hope. And uh, there were some interesting people who worked with those Molson's Mill uh, artists. Um, Frederick Banting, I think, was uh, associated with them at one point, and perhaps even some members of the group of seven. Um, there's also a young guy named uh, Buddy Shavlov, who uh, was part of the observing team at uh, Dunlap Observatory looking for Perseids in 1939 in August. And when he grew up, uh, he eventually became a Nobel laureate in physics because he co-invented the laser. So it, it's fascinating when you think about uh, young people showing potential, going out looking at meteors, and then going and having uh, great careers. Um, the International Geophysical Year that I mentioned here uh, was almost like a, a worldwide citizen science project. And Millman's big uh, collaboration with that, once he was out in Ottawa, uh, involved setting up a larger and more elaborate um, meteor observation teams. Aha! Now, th this is sort of where I come into the story. Um, this was the Perseid meteor shower in 1986. And um, this was, uh, I think, 35 years ago tonight. Um, and uh, thousands of people across the eastern USA and Canada had gone outside to look for Perseids, and they saw this mysterious cloud, uh, just like it is in those sketches on the left side of the screen. And it moved from west to east, and it was observed even by Tom Bolton at David Dunlap Observatory. And you can see there, that's a, a page from the DDO observing notebook. Um, and Dr. Bolton recognized that it might be a barium cloud because he was aware that there are some suborbital rocket tests sometimes that fly up into the uh, thermosphere, perhaps, and they release a cloud of barium gas or dust, um, and that can fluoresce or shine in uh, interesting ways. Turns out it wasn't a barium cloud. It was actually um, uh, a Japanese rocket that had just gone into space and was orbiting the Earth. And there were extra propellants and rocket fuel that was inside this rocket after it got into space. And they opened the valves and released all of that excess gas into space so that it wouldn't explode. Um, and because the sun had just set over the eastern seaboard, but it was still shining up there, we were all able to see it. I saw this myself. Um, at first, it was a big uh, sort of UFO type thing, but also um, once its explanation came out, um, I think we were all kind of fascinated by it. Uh, and this is uh, just another page. This is from the Skeptical Inquirer. This is a piece that was written by James Oberg, who's a famous space historian. Um, and you can see down at the bottom there, it mentions uh, Tom Bolton of David Dunlap Observatory getting it right. Um, but then we also have people like uh, Dan Aykroyd, uh, the actor. And uh, Dan Aykroyd was um, uh, at his place on Martha's Vineyard. And uh, his version of the story changes periodically. Uh, but he's um, uh, a kind of a UFO uh, follower. And uh, he's even released uh, books and popular subjects on that um, uh, and he basically doesn't usually accept the, uh, the, the common or garden explanation that it was just a Japanese spacecraft. I think he thinks that it was uh, uh, actually little green men. But then a few years later, um, the source of the Perseids was expected. Now remember, this had been discovered in 1860s. 
uh, and it hadn't been seen since then. Um, but there were some good predictions. This is the Sky and Telescope magazine from August of 1992 saying, well, where is this Comet Swift Tuttle? Uh, is it going to come back and replenish our supply of Perseid meteors? Uh, well, yes, it did. Uh, just one month later, Japanese amateur astronomer Tsuruhiko Kiyuchi uh, discovered Comet Swift Tuttle coming back into the inner solar system. Um, there was a, a, a newswire story you can see for, here from Sydney, Australia, that was carried in the Globe a couple weeks later, saying that just because they had made this discovery of, of Comet Swift Tuttle coming back after 130 years, uh, they were on the basis of that saying that uh, there was a risk that the comet was going to collide with the Earth the next time it comes back around in 2116. Um, now, I've, uh, I've written in 2116, but we actually think that uh, the comet is going to be coming back uh, about 10 years later than that. So uh, there's a, a lot not quite right about this figure here. Uh, including the name, this is called Comet Smith-Tuttle, not Swift-Tuttle. So let's get the names right. And here are some pictures of Comet Swift-Tuttle that were taken in 1992. Um, Note that it's Comet Swift Tuttle. It's Tuttle, not Bottle. And here is the observing chart that I made back in 1993 in August, the next summer when we saw lots of Perseid meteors. And you can make a chart like this yourself if, if you know the constellations. You can even trace it onto a piece of tracing paper and then write down the paths of the various meteors you find and see if they lead back to the constellation Perseus like they do here. And I just have one more slide. This is in case we have bad weather. Now, I'm looking out. My sky looks okay, so I'm going to look for some Perseids outside tonight, I think, unless it gets cloudy. But if it does get cloudy, all you need to do is to go to YouTube, and you can listen to a source from the Internet that is actually giving you a kind of meteor-watching experience. This is a radio receiver in Washington, D.C., and it's looking over the horizon, um, and it's pointed towards a radio transmitter we think is in Timmins, Ontario. Now, normally, the difference between Timmins and Washington, the distance is so great, there's no way to pick up a signal that far away. But if a meteor flies over somewhere in between those two locations, um, the hot gases that are ionized by the passage of the meteor act as a radio reflector and they can bounce the signal from Timmins all the way to Washington, D.C. Um, because of the way that that signal and that ionized trail moves, you can hear a funny sort of fluted noise. And if this works, um, Andrew, I'm, I'm going to try and end the talk. And I'm going to go over to my other window. And I'm going to unmute it so that we can hear it. And this is actually live. Can you hear anything? Well, if you can't hear anything, um, you can also see the graphic representations of what's going on. This red signal here is right underneath the transmitter at 55.24 megacycles. And you can't hear it? Yeah, we yeah, can. We can. Yeah, we okay. It. Normally, you basically hear radio snow because, as I said, it's you're looking beyond the radio horizon. But yeah. perhaps once every minute, something will happen, and you'll hear a weird fluting noise, um, and the graphics will pop up here, and something will appear on the track. And uh, there's no need for us to wait on this for too long. I just thought I'd point it out. We can move on to the next talk. Hey, thank you so much. All, all right. right. Well, you can all listen to this at home. Perfect. I have posted a, uh, a link into the chat um, to that site that you were just showing us. So, uh, yes, absolutely. You know, click on that link, bookmark that. 
and um, and you know listen to the meteors for yourselves if it's cloudy where you are. But of course, if it's clear, you might want to get out and actually observe the meteors. So we're going to move on to uh, to Chris Vaughn now. He's got some information about observing. Chris. So I'm going to cover two. Thank you, Denise. I'm going to cover two topics. Uh, one is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, meteorites and what we can learn about the solar system from them. And then I'll give you some tips on the best things you can do to see the most meteors and uh, may maybe where to go to look for some meteors. So first thing I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here. And you can see I've got a website called uh, meteorshowers.org. And this you can update with any given meteor shower. And it's it's a 3D model of the solar system. You can see the sun is in the middle and the planet orbits are around. The Earth's orbit is the blue one. And then the white cloudy orbit is the, is the orbit of Swift-Tuttle, Comet Swift-Tuttle. If I zoom back out, you can see just how big Swift-Tuttle's orbit is compared to the solar system. So it really spends a lot of time out away from the sun and then just dips in, as Eric said, and, and, and Nira said, you just said, uh, every 133 years. And you can actually take this model and put a time in here and you can make it where you can animate it so you can see it playing and you can watch how, I'll just zoom in here, you can see that little blue dot of the Earth once a year comes around and intersects the orbit of the comet. And many meteor showers have that happen. So I'm going to bring up a map, a diagram from a friend of mine named Blake Nancaro, and he produced a cool diagram of the year and the amount of meteors we see through the year. Let me just see if we can get this to open up. Here we go. This is the calendar year from basically April, May, June, July on, so on. And here we are, we're sitting in August and the taller the peak, the more meteors you see. And you can see that the meteor showers actually start off slow. They ramp to a peak, peak night, maybe a couple of nights, it depends on the shower. And then they fade away. And that's because the earth is entering the debris cloud in the middle of it or the, or the thickest part of it. And then we move out of it gradually as well. So the Perseids actually last for a few weeks with a strong peak uh, tonight, last night and tonight. And the next big shower we get of the year is the Geminid meteor shower, which is even more uh, strong than the Perseids, more uh, meteors seen at the peak. And that comes in December, around mid-December, the red, the red mark here. So you can see that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a meteor. Let's bring this up here. I'm just going to put this away and bring back to my stream. So this is actually a meteor. I don't know if you can see that too clearly. So this is a meteorite. So you can remember the difference because most rocks end in the, in the letters I-T-E, like granite. So a meteor, if you add I-T-E, becomes meteorite. And the meteorite is the rock that lands on the ground. And you can see this, this meteorite, it weighs about 45 grams. And it's, it's called um, a nickel iron meteorite. So it's, I'll give you the contents in a minute. So this meteorite is part of a big meteor that came in close to the earth and exploded in the earth's atmosphere uh, on February 12th, 1947. And eyewitnesses saw it crash to the ground, a great fireball across the sky a smoke trail that was uh, 33 kilometers long. And it came in from the north, barreling down at tremendous speed. I think it was traveling at 50,500 kilometers per hour when it hit the Earth's atmosphere. And if you've ever accidentally belly flopped into a pool, even though the water is soft, if you hit it at a high enough speed, it hurts and it could be uh, an intense hit. So even, even a meteor hitting the Earth's atmosphere, which is very thin, at a high enough speed, it'll, it'll be a big shock and it'll blow up. So this meteor came from a piece that we think weighed 100,000 kilograms or 100, met, 100 um, metric tons, broke up about 5.6 kilometers above the Earth's uh, ground level. And then all the pieces came, uh, came plowing into the Earth and covered a scattered a piece of land that was about um, 1.3 square kilometers. I'll just show you. A picture of the. Oh, I don't have the picture ready. Um, I can give you a link that shows you where the uh, map of the debris field. So the biggest piece that they found, it, it broke up into about eighty-five hundred fragments, um, and you can buy this piece as a meteor. So its, it's name is Sicoti Allen, uh, S I 
uh, K, uh, S I K H O T E hyphen A L I N, Sakoti Allen. It's a, it's a nickel iron meteorite. Um, the astronomers analyzed its trajectory as it was coming to the ground and they figured out that it must have been orbiting near the Earth, near the, uh, the asteroid belt of the solar system. Uh, so it's a very ancient piece of, of, of material. And it's basically important to science because it's a piece of the early building blocks of the, of the solar system. Every rock that you pick up on the Earth today has been processed, maybe gone through plate tectonics or, or subducted or run through a volcano or something, or it's been weathered and exposed to air and water and so on. But meteors come in and they're primordial, they're pristine, they've never been altered by any process. They're, they're the original material that the solar system was created from in the beginning. And so astronomers and scientists can actually analyze the mineral content and the isotopic content of the different elements in these rocks and determine what the early solar system was made of. And they can actually uh, correlate different meteors to different um, locations in the solar system and even different planets. So this one is from the main asteroid belt, but we've actually had pieces of Mars that have landed on the Earth and pieces of the moon that have landed on the Earth. And so uh, it's really, really fascinating. So this particular um, piece of meteorite, it's 93% iron. It's about 5.9% nickel, 0.42% uh, um, cobalt, a bit of um, phosphorus, some sulfur, and some other trace, trace minerals. So um, people are really interested in, in asteroids because if they can find ones that are pure metal like this, then they can go out and, and make mines in the solar system and, and harvest the minerals that are out there. So you can see that this, meteor, this meteorite has a sort of a dimple top. These are called sort of thumbprints. And then on the bottom, it's smooth. And we think that the bottom side is the sort of re-entry side, the kind of heat shield side, whereas the dimpled side was the upper side as it was plunging to the earth at high speed. So yeah, we think this is probably about 4.6 billion years old. If, we, if you ever run into me at, a, at an outreach event and I've got my meteorite with me, with me you, can, uh, you can hold it in your hand and it'll be the oldest thing that you ever touch in your hand. So let me switch over to Stellarium. So I'm, I'm gonna show you the sky. And this is the sky this evening. I can put it right now to now. So it's not dark yet in Richmond Hill. But if we let the, the hours tick by, so you can start looking for the meteors anytime once it gets dark if the skies are clear. If you've got a if you've got clouds, you're going to be out of luck. So you really need to be able to see the stars to hope to see the meteors. Now the meteors are most um, frequent after midnight because that's the time of the day when the Earth is turned and heading into the cloud of debris right over your head. So it's kind of like the sky over your head would be the the windshield of a car that's driving through a, a mass of bugs and they're hitting the windshield. So really the most meteors happen between midnight and dawn, but no problem. You can start watching for meteors as soon as it gets dark tonight, all the way to tomorrow. And even if, even keep your eye out for the next few days because they'll be tapering off, but you'll be still seeing some. But I'm just gonna bring the sky up later in the evening. So right now I've got um, August 12th at 22.14, which is 10 p.m. and 14 minutes. And if I just run this a little bit later, you can see that the constellation Perseus appears in the sky. And the, the radiant, the, uh, the point in space where the meteors appear to be coming from, they're not connected to the stars at all. All of this is happening in the Earth's atmosphere, um, you know, 100 kilometers or so above our heads. But the star, the meteors will appear to be emanating from from the constellation Perseus, and here's uh, here's Queen Cassiopeia and King Cepheus and Princess Andromeda and Pegasus. They're all up in the sky. So if you're up late after midnight, about one o'clock in the morning, you can see them. Now the reason we like to say well after midnight towards dawn is because as each hour goes by, the the radiant in Perseus gets higher and higher in the sky. When the radiant is low in the sky. Any meteors that are heading down, they're blocked by the Earth. But once the, once the radiant gets high in the sky, then there's no Earth to block them so we can see more meteors. So that's the idea there. Now, how about seeing the meteors? What's, what's our best advice? 
So the main thing is that you want to do is you want to get away from the city lights and artificial lights as much as you can. The meteors aren't, even though the fireballs are, are particularly bright, most meteors are medium bright, not as bright. And the more you'll, the better your eyes are adapted to the dark, the more meteors you'll see. So if you can't get away from town, try to find a location maybe in your yard with lots of trees or, um, you know, hide any, any street lights behind the corner of a building or something like that. Just try to get a spot where it's as dark as you can get it. Um, if you can get a place where there's lots, not too many tall trees, where there's lots of open sky, you don't really want to stare at the radiant because the meteors there will be coming straight towards you and they won't have very long tails on them. The most meteors you'll see are other places in the sky where the meteors have a chance to be skipping across the top of Earth's atmosphere. So you want a nice dark location. You want as much open sky as you can. Telescopes and binoculars are not going to help because they're too narrow to see the sky. You want to be able to just maybe have a chaise or a blanket, lie down and just look up, generally up, and just keep an eye all over the sky. Now, if you're with people, don't look at them when you're chatting because if they're looking up and you're looking at them, they'll see the meteor and you won't, and you'll be jealous. So everybody will just agree. We're just going to keep looking up and enjoy the meteors as we see them. When you see them, you want to shout out and uh, see, if, see if you can make a bit of a competition of it. So you want to dress warm enough. It gets cool overnight. Maybe bring some snacks. Another tip is don't use your phone because the light from your phone will spoil your dark adaptation. So you can either turn your brightness way down. You can also put red, red film covering your screen because red light will not affect or hurt your dark adaptation. Um, you might want to mute your notifications because sometimes a, a text can come in with a bright light on your phone. But better just to see if you can, just tuck your phone away out of sight so it's not going to spoil anybody's dark adaptation. So those are sort of my, my top tips for seeing meteors. Um, in terms of where you can go from Richmond Hill, let me just bring up my put this away here and bring up my map. So generally speaking, um, the light pollution from Toronto and, and Richmond Hill um, kind of covers the sky where we live. And the best way to get, um, avoid the, the bright lights, the, the washed out sky over our heads, is to actually get into the countryside, the rural areas. And for most rascals, we usually drive kind of northeast into sort of um, Northern Pickering or Southern Uxbridge, or maybe into the Northwest sort of Schaumburg. You can see there's Schaumburg's over here, um, Northern Kleinberg and even further afield if you can. Within about a half an hour, 40 minutes of driving, you can get away from the majority of the light pollution in Toronto and, uh, and get to a good site. Make sure it's safe. Make sure if you're going out that you file a flight plan, let people know where you're going so that um, you know they can, they can track you down if, if you get a flat tire or something. You know, go with a with a partner or a buddy. Make sure you've got some safety safety first. So, I'll I'll wrap it up there, and uh, I guess we can open questions. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, and thank you also, of course, to Nirja and Eric for all of this amazing information about the Perseids. I do have one question so far from you, uh, for you guys from our Zoom audience. And just a reminder, if you want to start adding your questions to the Zoom chat, I will be monitoring that and passing it on to uh, our presenters from tonight so that we can uh, answer all of those questions. So uh, Karen would like to know, around midnight, how many meteors can you see within about 30 minutes or an hour? Maybe Chris could take that one or Nirja. So the, the peak of the shower, at the peak of the shower, as, as Nirja mentioned, we can see 60, 80, 100 on a good year per hour um, when, the, when the rating is nice and high in the sky. So that's roughly one a minute. But it's it's an average, so sometimes you'll get two or three in a minute, and then maybe you'll have a gap. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat at this point. Um, I'll give people just a minute to, to add some questions. Um, one commonly asked question that I know do, people do like to um, to ask is how do we take photographs of meteors? 
Um, and I was going to share with you guys a great link uh, about how to photograph meteors. The short answer is that you want um, a camera with a manual mode. You want to use longer exposures and a wide angle lens. Generally, 16 to 50 millimeter lens is good. You want to mount your camera on a tripod, focus on a, on a star or a very distant light. And usually it's best to do that using live view with maximum magnification. If you keep your autofocus off, your camera won't refocus. Um, and that's really important. And then you want to play around with your ISO, your aperture and your, um, your shutter speed to get a good balance of light so that you can see the stars in the Milky Way and dark background. Usually ISO of 1600 or 3200 is a good range and 20 to, 20 to 30 seconds of shutter speed is good because um, that allows you to capture the full meteor as it streaks across the sky instead of cutting it off like halfway or only getting the back end of it. Um, but those settings will all depend, of course, on where you're located, how dark your sky is, how much light pollution there is. So you need to find the right balance and then start taking many images in a sequence or, um, or shooting video to get lucky enough to capture a meteor. So you will need spare batteries. You'll probably need a spare camera card. Be patient. It does take lots of time, but do take lots of images. Um, and if you're uh, already a camera pro and you're familiar with things like uh, software for stacking images, you can also do dark frames and stack your images to create amazing images that show many meteors all at once. Okay, so I am now seeing some great questions um, uh, in the chat. So uh, who is this? Ethan wants to know, do you have any suggestions for where to drive within about 15 minutes? But I think this depends on where Ethan is, right? Ethan, if you could maybe pop into the chat where you are, that would be helpful. And maybe we'll come back to that question. Um, Patrice wants to know, why are some meteors so little that they don't land? Who wants to take that? Yeah, I can take that. So as we discussed um, about how we see these meteors, when when they're absorbed into our atmosphere, um, because of the friction, they heat up. And often the small ones, before they reach the ground, they, they not only do they ionize the air around it, uh, but they also burn up themselves. So the small ones, before they reach um, land, they burn up. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nirja. Um, Ethan says he's at Bathurst and Rutherford. So 15 minutes from Bathurst and Rutherford. Any suggestions? Yeah. He could drive. Um, let me just bring my map up here. So for Bathurst and Rutherford, try to maybe head um, towards King City. So if you can get to um, an area like uh, even if you can find a conservation area, most of them would be dark, would be closed at nighttime, but you might be able to find um, uh, a, a park or a conservation area that's a little bit um, for you. You're already west of Young, so I would suggest going um, kind of northwest a little bit. Um, you could go, uh, let's see, got Keel Street here, um, you could go up to Seneca, Seneca King Campus. It wouldn't be very, very dark, but it would be darker than it is in central Richmond Hill. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Patrice would like to know what determines the size of a meteor? Maybe Nirja or Chris, you guys could take that one. Do you mean the length of the trail? Or the particle? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he means length of trail or part of, oh yes, he says yes, length of trail. So um, I kind of alluded to that. So the meteors that are coming toward you look shorter even though they're longer because they're foreshortened. If you take a stick and you turn it towards you, the stick looks short, but somebody standing beside you will see the long stick. So the meteors that, that are coming from the radiant will look like they're short even though they're not that short for somebody that would be kilometers over east or west of you. 
but the longest ones are the ones that that come um, instead of straight down to the earth but they come uh, at a tangent at a shallow slope to the earth's atmosphere they kind of skip along and they can go for many many kilometers across the upper atmosphere whereas the ones that are coming more vertically they would have a shorter streak Okay, and Ethan again would like to know, can a meteor have its trajectory changed from the wind or other natural causes? That's a great question. Can I answer that? Sure. Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, I don't think that the wind is much of a uh, something that affects meteors immediately, but especially with bright meteors that have some kind of persistence. If you see a fireball, after the fireball has passed, you might notice some light that's left behind. And this might actually be luminous dust. It's called the meteor train. Um, and this luminous dust is basically caught by whatever atmosphere it's passed through. And it will follow the wind and distort and change shape as uh, seconds or even minutes pass. That's only if you see a really nice bright fireball that leaves a meteor train behind it. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Eric. I hope that answers the question. Um, Louisa would like to know, does RASC hold any meteor sighting outings? And I can take this one. Louisa, the answer is yes, but not right now. So unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's Toronto Centre has suspended all in-person outreach activities, which is why we're doing these types of online events. So until that um, suspension is lifted and it's deemed safe um, to go back to doing public outreach, we're not, we're unfortunately not having any in-person events, um, but uh, we do normally do that. So usually every year around about the Perseids, there is some kind of event or events, multiple events happening in, around, um, in or around the city that you can attend. So definitely stay tuned for those when things get a little more back to normal. Um, and in the meantime, again, you're so welcome to take all the information that you've learned tonight and go out, whether in your backyard or a short drive out of town, uh, and have a great look at the Perseids at their peak. It does look like the weather is going to be pretty decent tonight, I think. Um, I, I heard a rumor it might be clearing out, so hopefully everybody will get a chance to see that. So that looks like all of our questions for now. Um, thank you guys so much to, thanks to all our viewers for this really engaging discussion. In a moment, we will end our event with a video tour of the David Dunlop Observatory's 74 inch or uh, 1.88 meter telescope, this one right behind me. But before we go, I thought you might like to know about some of our upcoming events. Our next events include a lecture from Dr. John Moores of York University on the cinematography of the sky. For Astronomy Speakers Night on August 20th, he'll be looking at the exciting things we've managed to observe and learn about by using robotic explorers to make movies on other planets. Then on August 22nd, we have a Sunday sun gazing event where we talk about safe solar observing and the features of the sun and live stream views of the sun from our members telescopes. These events are posted on our website www.rascto.ca and I will post that right into the chat. Um, so definitely have a look there for more details. Uh, we'll also be posting our September schedule in the next week or so. So all of these events are made possible through the partnership of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre and the City of Richmond Hill. Finally, I'd like to thank our Rascal members who uh, presented tonight, Neerja Shaw, Eric Briggs, and Chris Vaughan. And on behalf of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre and the Rask DDO Committee in particular, I'd like to thank the Richmond Hill Public Library and our partners at the City of Richmond Hill for organizing and promoting this event. Thanks also to our technical support team, Andrew Reed and Betty Reed, for their hard work behind the scenes. And thank you, especially our viewers, for joining us this evening and for your awesome questions. 
So let's end now with a quick tour of this historic telescope. On behalf of our team, I'd like to wish you all clear summer skies for the next few nights especially so that you can enjoy the Perseids at their best. Thanks and good night.